Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, my, brother, my dear brothers and sisters, to another edition of Real Talk. We've been talking about fostering and adoption this, uh, this, in this program. And I have with me Shadi Hussain from the Muslim Foster Network, uh, who has been here before, as I said, and has shared with us some of the work that he does, the, 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 the challenge that he faces in recruiting Muslim, Muslim families to foster, take on foster children and adopt children as well. Now, we've concentrated on fostering uh, in the past. Now, adoption obviously is a huge area as well, and adoption brings different complexities uh, you know, within this system. I mean, you know, um, we have, we've seen the case in, in East London where there was this accusation against the Muslim family that, you know, they were forcing this non-Muslim child, mm. you know, to eat halal food or not provide the food that she wanted. Five-year-old Christian yeah, girl. Yeah, five-year-old Christian girl, yeah. Yeah. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, things like that put people off, don't they? Indeed. Now, obviously, parents, anybody who wants to adopt a child or, you know, number of children, uh, they have to be flexible. They cannot stipulate the fact that they want only want a Muslim or a Pakistani background or an Indian background child, can they? No, no. And it's, it's a really good point, uh, good point, Iqbal, by that. Um, one of the challenges that we see in the sector, earlier we were speaking about the barriers, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know this will be of interest to prospective uh, adopters and foster carers because they would have looked into these matters. One of the issues that we see is that um, more often than not, um, the barriers that exist um, create a challenge for mm. those who have a good will and an intention, you know. Uh, and particularly from a, a local authority perspective, we found that those barriers we mentioned earlier to do with lack of cultural awareness, lack of cultural competency, they exist at local authority level. Mm. Some of the issues that exist at community level is we don't show a great deal of flexibility. So more often than not, when a potential Muslim foster carer comes forward, they may have a predetermined requirement for the type of child that they want to look mm. after. So somebody might come forward and say, I only want to look after a girl and, and she must be of this age or a boy and, and he must be of this age and I, I don't want to look after teenage boys or, or whatever the reasons might be. Mm. Yeah. Now, <coughs> we know that when we discuss the reasons for in detail, it may be that a situation like myself where Mashal, I've got four girls Right. Got three teenage girls, yeah. Mm. I wouldn't be so no. comfortable about having a teenage boy coming into my house mm. simply because of the merum issue and, and mm. because of the environment and uh, and the safeguarding issues related to that, yeah. Now, culturally and from a faith perspective, me speaking to another Muslim person or speaking to the audience would understand that, yeah. Mm. But speaking to a social worker who doesn't have that background or knowledge, yeah. they might make an assumption based upon you being inflexible. Yeah, that you're being sexist, maybe. Indeed. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you having a, a yeah. thing. So there is absolutely nothing wrong with you having a preference, mm -hmm. but you can't articulate that preference as being a prerequisite. Right. Because what we find is more people seem to talk themselves out of moving forward in the assessment mm -hmm. process by putting up too many requirements to start with. So we always advise everyone to be open-minded, right. to be willing to look after all children. So are you basically saying that if you have a, a Muslim parent uh, who says, you know, I'd like to foster, but I only want to foster a Muslim child, yeah. that would automatically debar them? Not necessarily. Forward? Not necessarily. So um, a lot is dependent upon the area of the country that you're right. in. And this is why research is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, before you put your name forward and, and, and let's say you have such a preference, yeah, it's, all, it's, it's very important for you to understand what the local needs are. It's not necessary that throughout England there's a shortage of Muslim foster carers. Mm -hmm. In some areas, there's a good number of Muslim foster carers. Yeah? In areas that we're working in, um, Rotherham, Bradford, Rochdale, uh, Liverpool, Croydon, Lewisham. So these are six local authorities who have approached us and we have been working directly with them. Yeah? Right. They have all clearly said that they have a need 
for more Muslim foster carers and they're happy to take them. Right. So in that situation, if a family comes forward and says, um, I'd only feel comfortable or I'd prefer to look after a, a Muslim child a Muslim for these child. reasons, yeah, and as long as the, the reasons are, are, are sensible reasons, then those local authorities are taken on because currently in those local authorities, they have a significant number of Muslim children who they are not able to place with Muslim carers. Yeah. Right. So essentially when a child is in care, Iqbal Bai, um, the local authority has to make a choice as to which foster carer they place them with or which adoptive parent they should mm. go to. And a lot would depend upon the circumstances and the background of the child. And of course, being Muslim is not a one size fits all, as mm. we know. You know, we practice our faith differently. differently yes. There's different strands of Islam. And therefore, each child is unique in their own circumstances. Mm. And where the local authority can match and have a best match, let's say it's a, a South Asian, Pakistani, England, mm. Bangladeshi Muslim child, and they're matched with uh, a foster family or an adoptive mm. family of that background, great. But going back to the point that Tanvir had raised, uh, and the point that we were making about matching, one of the big challenges and the reason why there's such a high number of children awaiting to be matched with a suitable adopters in this case is because a very high and a significant portion of Muslim children who are in care are mixed race. Right. Yeah, it may be that they have a dual heritage. It may be yes. that the, the mother is white British and, and the father is South Asian, for example. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and as both parents have a right over, uh, let's say, the destiny of their child, they can specify to say that I would like my child to be placed with a Muslim family. Mm. Or they may be indifferent or they may be flexible. So a lot of these decisions are dependent upon the child and the circumstances and the requirements of the local authority. Do the parents of the child who you know from whom the a child has been taken away. Do they still have any right to exercise their preferences? Well, I think to understand that, it's important to understand the difference between uh, adoption and fostering. Right. So essentially, um, when a child is taken into care and they go through a, a legal process and the family court and, and, and the judge would make that decision, they would either decide that this child is placed in adoption or placed in foster care. Right. If the decision is taken that they should be placed into adoption, then the legal relationship between the birth parents and the child finishes at that point. Right. And that legal responsibility passes on to the adoptive right. family, yeah? okay. or, or the local authority in the interim. Yeah, in the social worker. In the case of foster care, mm -hmm. the child is the legal responsibility of the local authority and or the parent oh, I see. so it could be it's a partnership yeah it, it, yeah it could be it could be that at some point the circumstances of that family maybe the mother or the father have some challenges and they're rehabilitated and the child may have some challenges and the child is rehabilitated there may well be an opportunity where families can come back together right i see right so there's a there's a safeguard mechanism indeed in a way built into that yeah. i mean i mean that's really a, a very good explanation of you know the processes between the two I mean, as far as you know, I see this is uh, that we have here a situation where you know we have over three three thousand Muslim children who are in the care system, uh, as you mentioned previously, and they're all looking for good Muslim families to take them into their homes, give them a loving, caring environment, give them the opportunity to to hold on to their to their ethnic backgrounds, their, but much more much more importantly you know, uh, the faith background if they're so inclined. And there's a desperate need for more and more Muslim foster parents to, to, to people to, actually uh, Muslim families to register as a, uh, an interest to become foster parents. And although, as I said, the, the process is not easy, and as Salim says, you know, it does go through a, a number of hoops and barriers, but with the right support and the right element, you know, people can navigate through that and become successful foster parents. And maybe as we heard, you know, from uh, Tanvir, who actually adopted two children, it's a very rewarding situation to be in. Now, in the sense that, you know, the private agencies, I mean, with the private agencies, do you feel that the barriers are sort of are lower, the, the process is much more simpler, 
and they don't have the same sort of constraints as public sector organizations do? Yeah, I think it's, um, we, we've got to uh, be fair and recognize that, um, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been significant cuts in, in budgets for local authorities, you mm. know, so austerity measures have, are really bitten. Um, and, you know, local authorities have had to cut back. Um, so the key difference that I see, as I mentioned earlier, between um, the experiences we found between um, private sector and, and the public sector in this case is, is, is in some cases simply down to customer service, you know, right. is, is that speed of response. Um, and, and secondly, it's um, how well you're managed through that process, you know, and, and if you feel that things are so not are explained. So are the private sector much more better resourced than the public sector at this moment in time? Absolutely. They are? Without doubt. So they have mo more resources available to them to help families navigate through this process than the public sector, the local authorities themselves? I would I would say so, yeah. yeah. Obviously I mean, ba you based upon experience now, I mean, it's it's difficult for me to be able to uh, pass that judgment as to whether or not there's a difference in resource because the private sector are commissioned by the public sector, mm. you know. So when, you know, the way that the system works is that when a child goes into care, they become the responsibility of the local authority. Mm -hmm. The local authority is uh, then required to recruit their own foster carers. When they don't have a sufficient number of foster carers, then they will outsource to the private sector. All right. Yeah. But the child and the responsibility is always with the local authority. All right. Yeah. So in essence, the local authority is then paying the independent agency to do mm. that work and to place that child, yeah. So um, the resource is coming from the local authority, mm. you know. And, and as I explained earlier, um, independent agencies are paying their foster carers on average more than local authorities are, right. you know. Uh, and, and of course, you know, as we've mentioned in previous discussions, well, Iqbal, by that, you know, most Muslim people who come forward they consider it as an act of faith, mm. you know, and they do it for good reason. And, well, and I, think, I, think the majority, I think the majority of them would do so because I think the majority of them from the people, you know, in the past when people have rung in. Yeah. I don't think any, any people that I've come across and every I've known who has fostered children do it for the sake of the money. I think they do it because they, they want to do it out of the goodness of their heart. You know, Indeed. They, they have a, Indeed. a sympathy. And, and we're, not, we're not doubting that, but mm. what we are recognizing is that... Um, it's a matter of choice. Mm. So, so you know, we're, we're all consumers in the marketplace. So when you have a choice of achieving the same goal and objective, but the level of support you receive mm. and the level of service and the level of uh, the allowance and, and the financial support too is more on this side, mm. then that, that, that will sway people. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure it, will, you know? it will be a factor. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. You know, because I think more than money is the support, indeed, the back backup support that people would need. Yeah. You know, particularly, I mean, we spoke last time. We talked to you know one of one or two of the people who adopted people with learning difficulties, etc., or challenging behaviour, and they were saying that you know although it was difficult and challenging for them, but at the end it was ext extremely rewarding, not just for themselves, but for the child that also came into their family as well, and they left the family when they moved on a much, much better person than when they first came in. I mean, in terms of, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the program. In terms of where we go next, obviously the initiative that, you know, the, uh, Shadim and his group, the Muslim Foster Network, have started, which is being launched on this Friday, inshallah, you know, 100 Muslim foster parents for 100 Muslim, uh, for, through 100 mosques, is something that is laudable, something that we should all support, and, you know, we should all encourage. And I hope that you know those who are watching this program will ask um, will ask sort of the, their mosques to to bring the you can see the poster on the screen uh, bring this to the attention of the musallis on Friday in their mosque in their local communities as well. Now, obviously, this is not something that we can you know we can overcome overnight. Uh, there is, as I, as Saadim has said in the past, there is over three thousand Muslim children who are in the foster care in sorry in the in the social care, uh, social work networks, so in the care system uh, that social workers and social services 
uh, have responsibility for, all of them would be, you know, I'm sure would, would love to be placed with families. Uh, so there's, I encourage every one of you uh, to look at yourselves and see whether you could be one of those families who could provide a loving, caring, Islamic environment within which to bring these children up, like Brother Tanweer and his good wife are doing, and the previous callers in the previous programs have done. Uh, so I think obviously this is something that you know you have started your initiative. Uh, we'll have to call you back again to talk yes. more how this initiative has gone, and see how you know how many mosques have uh, certainly taken up the challenge that you posed them. I hope you found this program interesting and something enlightening as well. As I said right at the beginning, this is a challenging issue, and people like Sadim obviously are doing some wonderful work. I hope that you will also be encouraged. Inshallah, we'll see you very soon. Inshallah, I'll see you next week. In the meantime, take care. May Allah look after you and me and everybody else and Sadim and all those people who are doing good work around the world. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.